This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to The Self-Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Welcome back. This is going to be a unique and memorable episode. Growing up as a farm kid in Kansas, my guest would fantasize about airplanes. Although it seemed at the time to be unattainable, after joining the United States Navy, that dream became a reality. Once he graduated from the Naval Academy, Charlie Plum completed Navy flight training and was sent to Miramar Naval Station in San Diego, where he became involved in the development of what would come to be called the Navy Fighter Weapons School, currently known as Top Gun. After being deployed to Vietnam in what would have been his 75th mission, Captain Charlie Plum was shot down in his F-4 Phantom over Hanoi. This was just days before the end of his tour. He was captured, taken prisoner, brutally tortured, and spent the next 2,103 days as a prisoner of war in an 8x8 cell at what is ominously referred to as the Hanoi Hilton. In his autobiography, I'm No Hero, he tells the story of how he, as well as his fellow POWs, faced and overcame degradation, loneliness, hunger, and extreme pain. But this isn't just a story about suffering and triumph over adversity. Perhaps more significantly, it's a story about hope. In his book, as well as within this episode, Charlie shares some of the insights and strategies that he used to survive and eventually thrive, despite being in the worst circumstances imaginable. As you listen to Charlie in his authentic, humble, and quite often humorous style, I think you'll be captivated and inspired like I was as he draws from his experience as a POW and creates parallels to how we can turn adversity to advantage in everyday life, no matter what the obstacles. There's so much value that Charlie brings to this episode, but obviously it's hard to capture his full story, the experience, and lessons in just over an hour. If you go to his website, charlieplum.com, you can buy an autographed copy of his book, By the end of the show, you'll understand why that's a worthwhile read. Also, I didn't realize it at the time, but we were having a little bit of technical difficulty. Charlie sounds great, which is most important, but even though you can clearly understand me, you'll notice that I'm not sounding quite as crisp as I usually do. I'm sorry about that. Again, this is going to be a great episode, and thanks for being with us. Dr. Charlie Plum, it is an absolute honor. Thank you for joining us on the Self-Help Antidote. Thank you, Bobby. Pleasure to be with you. Okay, so you're a kid growing up in Kansas, and you have this fascination at a very young age with airplanes. You know, farm kid, you know, like, like a kid living anywhere. You're looking up at these things in the sky, and you're thinking, wow, you know, it would be amazing to fly that, but I'll never get to do that. And then, you know, fast forward years later, and you graduate from the Naval Academy, and you're on the cusp of having a childhood dream turn into a very concrete reality. And and not only do you get to fly planes, you get to fly a particular type of plane, F-4 Phantom. And I I guess this is a two-part question. One, what was so special about that particular plane And how did you get assigned to it? Because that's a fascinating and and it's a little bit of a cheeky story. Well, I don't know what part you you want is cheeky, but I'll tell you (laughs) what happened. Uh, It it is a fascinating airplane. A lot of people are in love with the F-4 Phantom. In fact, there's a club that has three or 4,000 members of F-4 Phantom lovers, and most of them are not pilots, mechanics, or anybody that ever touched a Phantom. They're just, they just like the, the looks and the sound and, uh, and why is it so special? Well, it's a really mean looking airplane. It has two powerful General Electric J79 engines that put out about four, about um, 
uh, 17, 1800 uh, pounds of thrust each, 17, 18,000 pounds of thrust each. So you have a thrust to weight ratio when that thing is light loaded of more than more than one. So essentially that airplane can go up like a rocket. Um, and so it was absolutely the most powerful airplane uh, that, that I had ever flown by that time in my life. And, and so uh, I, was, I was thrilled to get that job. Why did I, why did I get Phantoms? Well, I did, I did a little better than average in flight training. You know, I, I love to fly and it came fairly naturally to me. Uh, I had made a lot of carrier landings by that time and, and, uh, and that's kind of a tricky thing to do. Uh, and I'd, I'd done that, uh, that, that pretty well. But probably the reason is that the Vietnam War was about to start and they needed a bunch of cannon fodder. <laughs> and so they, so they put me in the Phantom. <laughs> Now, you were somebody that, you know, early in your career flying, you would, when I said by cheeky, you would test your skills with other pilots. So you would you would push the envelope of your skill development. And you, you thought at one point that you had gotten into a little bit of trouble, but some, something quite different actually happened. And that kind of changed your trajectory. Talk to us a little bit about that. When I, when I showed up at Miramar, uh, there was a six month wait to fly this F4 Phantom. And it was really disappointing because I was, you know, I was full, full of vinegar and man, I was ready to go. I, I wanted to fly the airplane along with my buddy, Paul Krukey. So we showed out up out there and we were really depressed that we had no airplane to fly. So we walked down the flight line and there was a squadron of airplanes uh, teaching instruments, uh, instrument uh, flying. It, it, we, you do this under a hood to simulate uh, conditions in a cloud. So you can't see anything. You can't see the horizon. You don't know what's up or what's down. Um, and this is instrument flight training. So they happened to be flying the same airplane that we had flown in flight training, the F-9 Cougar. Now this is a little jet and it's, um, it, 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 it's slow, uh, but it's light. And, um, and so we signed on to take these students up uh, and teach them instrument training. But it was very boring for us because, you know, you just grind around and you're making 20 degree angle of bank turns and, you know, um, 500 feet a minute uh, ascent and, and descents. And, and it just, it, so, um, you know, we wanted to get into the fighter game, right? And so we would lurk off the coast of San Diego and wait for the phantoms to come out. Now, this, the Phantom is a, is a Mach 2 airplane. It's a high altitude supersonic interceptor, but they had no idea how to dogfight uh, because the thing was designed during the Cold War when they assumed that you would never have an, a you know, close encounter with another airplane. Our, our mission in Phantom, in fact, we wore spacesuits to fly this airplane because we were to fly high, shoot down the Russian bombers, make a slow turn, come back to the aircraft carrier, and that was our mission. And so we would lurk, uh, Paul and I would lurk, our, lurk off the coast of San Diego and wait for the F Phantoms to come out. And they, they, about the time they got the, the gear in, in the, the well, uh, and, and they were, uh, but they were heavy, uh, they were fast, but they couldn't turn. And so we'd pounce on these guys. <laughs> and it was really fun, you know. It was we, so we were coming back uh, after one successful mission when we'd shot down all these phantoms. Of course, this was highly illegal. You know, we weren't supposed to be even in the airspace, you know, with the supersonic guys. <laughs> and so we were doing high fives, and you know, we we had our Snoopy goggles and our white scarves, white scarves flying, and and uh, noticed on the bulletin board in the ready room. Plum and Krukey report to the commanding officer of the F-4 squadron immediately. Mm -hmm. So here's two 23-year-old guys, okay, uh, knocking on the door of the commanding officer of the F-4 squadron. Now, we, of course, we were in our sweaty flight suits with bloody eyeballs because uh, when you pull that many Gs, well, you, you get pretty sweaty and you, your eyes kind of get bloody. And, and so uh, we hear the come in. And so we open the door. Okay, and here's this, this old guy, you know, I mean, probably 32 or 33. I mean, just, you know, ancient guy. He's sitting at this big wooden desk looking over the top of his reading glasses. Now, 
he was in a, a, a sweaty flight suit too, and he had red eyeballs, and that should have been our <laughs> indicator, but <laughs> we didn't know any better. And so he looks it up with a very serious face. He said, you the two guys out there in, in the F-9 Cougars today? Uh, yeah, 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 sir, we were. Um, we did, did, did you, um, did, did you hassle, did you dog fight with the F-4 Phantoms? <clears throat> well, um, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, sir, we, we did. He said, you know, that's illegal. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. He said, did you follow a Phantom through an entire loop with your gun sights on the Phantom the entire time? Uh, we said, uh, <clears throat> yes, sir, that was us. He said, do you know who was in that Phantom? <laughs> we thought we were toast. He said, I saw you back there at my six o'clock. He said, I just came back from Vietnam and you looked an awful lot like MiGs back there. And we don't know how to fight MiGs. You want to come back and do the same thing tomorrow? <laughs> and so for the next six months, Paul Krueke and I had the ideal dream. And we, we were dogfighting every day with the Phantoms and trying to teach them how to dogfight because they didn't know how. Well, that they started a syllabus then uh, with adversarial flights like us, and that later became the Top Gun School. Uh, this they, it was a syllabus first, and then it was Navy Fighter Weapon School, uh, and then it was on its own squadron. So, so we accidentally uh, flew the first adversarial flights for the Top Gun School. Wow. That is, that is an incredible story. So Top Gun, you're saying that this is your ideal dream. And obviously there's a lot, there's a lot of value to what you guys are doing to, for the military. And you find yourself heading to Vietnam. What was, what was your first thought when you were told that you were being deployed to Vietnam? I was excited. You know, I had trained for nearly two years to fly this airplane and fight the enemy. And, and so, you know, training gets kind of boring uh, after a while. I mean, it's, you, you, you try your best and, and you do good. And, and, but to actually, to, you know, to actually um, gauge the value of your training and the value of you as a, as a, a warrior, you got to get into combat. And so I was excited to, to go to war uh, as everybody else was. You know, the, this is what we were trained to do. We wanted to prove ourselves, and so we launched uh, from um, Pier 3 there at San Diego in North Island, uh, the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk, and uh, we were going to war. I waved goodbye to my wife. I'd married my high school sweetheart, and I waved goodbye to her, and I promised her I'd be back in eight months, and I almost made it. Almost. So you flew 75 missions in Vietnam. Actually. 74 and a half, yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll get to that in All right. just a minute. How long was it from the time that you arrived in Vietnam until you got to go on your first mission? Uh, it was about uh, a month. Um, I arrived in November, and it was late December, early January when I uh, flew my first mission. What goes on in your head when you're waiting between the time you arrive and the time you get to go on your first mission? Well, obviously you're anxious, you know, there are nerves. You don't know how well you're going to do. Uh, you feel, you know, you feel pretty well trained because boy, in the military, it's just over and over and over. You run through all of the possibilities, you know, all, all of the, the machinations of anything that can happen to you and how you're going to respond to that. And so, it's almost to the point where you, you don't even you don't even think about what's happening. It's just you, you just automatically respond. And so I was confident that I could do the job, but there was always a little bit of nerves there. Um, but I, you know, I was excited and ready to go. So fifty missions in, what's your confidence level like? Uh, I was pretty confident, and fifty missions in, um, I had. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd been in a couple of dogfights with the enemy. I had um, flown well and, and come back to the aircraft carrier, uh, sometimes uh, at night, sometimes in bad weather. Um, and so, you know, I was the youngest guy in the squadron, but oh, by the way, I was holding my own with, uh, with most of the other guys. So I felt pretty good. And now you're, you've got like five days left 
in Vietnam and you're flying on your 74th and a half mission and you're you're deep into enemy territory over North Vietnam. What happens? It was a what we call an alpha strike, which was the biggest uh, strike that you can have. Um, and we had three aircraft carriers and five Air Force bases, uh, all, uh, all the airplanes in the air, uh, just really, really trying to pounce on these guys. Uh, turned out to be Ho Chi Minh's birthday. He was the president of Vietnam, at the, the North Vietnam at the time, and a very revered president. And I, I, I didn't know that at the time, but I think our psychological warfare folks thought that we would catch them in celebration of President's Day, and um, it, it didn't happen that way. <laughs> they, they shot down eight F-4 Phantoms on the 19th of May of 1967, and one of them was mine. So they knew. They knew. They knew we were coming. So when did you first realize that you had been shot down, like the very first? Uh, we were coming in close to the target. My job that day was, uh, was to, to protect the bombing group. I, I didn't have any bombs. I just had missiles to, to shoot down other airplanes. And uh, so that was my job that day was to protect the group from enemy airplanes. And so we were probably eight or 10 miles short of the target. And uh, uh, I felt a little bump. It, was, you know, it didn't really feel like an explosion at all. And then my panel lit up like a Christmas tree. I just had red lights all over the panel. I lost my hydraulic pressure, so my stick didn't work anymore. I couldn't turn the airplane. Um, and uh, and it, it went into a slow roll and I found myself upside down. <clears throat> well, and the, the way you get out of a jet airplane is with an injection seat. And uh, it's like a rocket under your chair. When you set off the rocket, it shoots your chair off the top of the airplane. But we were upside down. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Problematic. With, with no control, with no, with no stick control. So the stick controls your pitch and your roll. Uh, the yaw of the airplane is controlled by a rudder. And I did have, uh, there was no, the, the rudder was hydraulically um, activated, but uh, it was manual, it was, it was boosted by hydraulics. You could actually, you could actually affect the rudder with your, with your feet, but it takes a lot. It takes 40 pounds of pressure. And I think I put 80 pounds of pressure on it. It, uh, it, it rolled back upright. I ejected, my co-pilot ejected, our parachutes opened, and we came floating down well inland over enemy territory. Now, you had said earlier that when you're flying a mission, you just react, you respond, your training kicks in. What goes through your mind, though, in this particular situation that you've never been in before? I mean, everybody probably dreads this particular situation. What's happening? What are you thinking? Good question. Uh, in, in trying to think back to those instances, and of course, I replayed that thing a thousand times while, while I was there. <clears throat> but in thinking back uh, to it, I, I feel like um, I was in shock. Uh, I, I really felt they didn't have a missile big enough to shoot down Charlie Plum. And, 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 and I think, you, you know, you, you, can't really, you can't really fly in a combat situation assuming that you're going to be, um, you better stay home. Uh, and uh, it, because it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so I flew those missions, you know, always assuming I was going to come back to the aircraft carrier every time. And so I was just really surprised and bewildered, you know, that I was hanging in that parachute. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, my, my senses are really heightened. Now, now to begin with, uh, one of the things that I always wondered was what I know when to get out of the airplane. I mean, every pilot will tell you if they're going to try to save their airplane, they're going to try to, uh, to make a dead stick landing somewhere. If they have any control at all of the airplane, they're going to try to bring it down. They're not going to try to, to parachute. Uh, and I always kind of wondered if, uh, you know, if, if, I would, if I would have the presence of mind to do that. Well, <laughs> it was automatic. I, I didn't need any, uh, any help from anybody to tell me that um, um, 
that I was uh, that I needed to pull that uh, face curtain. And so, uh, pull the face curtain. Uh, it, the the ejection itself is 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 pretty strong. It, it hits you in the butt with about sixteen times your weight and uh, instantaneous G's. Uh, and then you're you know you're flailing through the sky and your parachute opens and that's a pretty good jerk. Um, and then things get real quiet until they start shooting at you. And so they were actually shooting at me while I was in the parachute. And so um, I thought that, that, that wasn't fair. You know, they just knocked down my, my gazillion dollar airplane. <laughs> it's a bit rude to say the least. I thought that was rude. Uh, so, uh, you know, for my, my immediate thought was escape. How do I get out of this situation? And I scanned the horizon. I was coming down over a, a rice paddy, uh, the, the water and mud of a rice paddy. And, but there was villages all around. This was in a, a suburb of Hanoi, the capital city. So it was a very populated area. And uh, I could see, you know, bunches of houses and, uh, and bunches of people uh, when I came down. And I, and I looked, I remember looking at a, a hedgerow and I thought if I can only get to that hedgerow, it, you know, it might give me some, uh, some, a place to hide. You know, might be able to, to find some kind of security there. Um, and, you know, and, and I looked back at the hills and wondered if I could get back to the hills, uh, you know, out of this rice paddy. And I tried to memorize in my, not, my, my mind the, 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 the trails and the roads and, and everything on my way down. Of course, shooting at me they knew where I was and so there was they were they were on me immediately I mean they they were right at the spot where I landed in the mud in that rice paddy uh, even before I was there but you realize very quickly that escape is not an option at this point I did uh, of course it was always in the back of my mind it was it was Escape was in the back of my mind for the 2,103 days. Every day, you know, I thought about how in the world do I get myself out of here? But it was beginning to look like um, I was going to be there for a while. So when you're, you're captured, how do you or do you, can you prepare yourself for what you're about to endure? These are really good questions. Um, the military has what they call SERI school, S-E-R, mm -hmm. Survival, Escape, Resistance, Evasion. And I'd been through four of those schools to teach me to be a prisoner of war and found out that there was very little value in anything I had learned in any of those four schools. Um, the way you, you know, the, <laughs> the way you prepare yourself, you know, for a situation like that is in the sandbox when you're three years old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a... Uh, you know, it's a very baseline uh, value systems uh, that you have that actually uh, prepare you for any adversity, not just being a prisoner of war, but, you know, going through a divorce or, you know, I mean, you've seen some adversity in your life. You know that you, that you can't train, you know, you, you, you can't train for abuse. Uh, you can't train for disfigurement. You, you can't train for um, what, you, what you see in life. It's it, it's, it better be there, you know, when you show up. So, um, so while the series schools, I think were somewhat, could have been somewhat valuable had I landed uh, maybe in the jungle somewhere where I had to forage for food, they teach you that. Um, or at, at, if I'd gone down at sea uh, and had to, uh, to survive in a raft uh, you know, and, and fish for my food uh, from a raft, that kind of thing. But uh, in the situation that I was in, uh, it's just, you know, I just depended on uh, the things that I had been told as a kid and the, the coaches that had uh, tried to instill some grit in me. And, and so that was, that was pretty much how I survived. Okay, so now you're being, you're being transported. What's the... What's the first place that they take you? Uh, the, the, the airstrike was still going on. Uh, when I was shot down, there were still lots of airplanes in the sky and they were making bombing runs all around. And so they put me in a schoolroom 
uh, and they tied me to a desk uh, in the schoolroom. They, of course, they stripped me of everything I had. I'm in the nude, and they, they tied my arms behind my back, <clears throat> and um, they blindfolded me and gagged me and tied me to this desk. And <clears throat> I could hear the airplanes. <clears throat> I could hear the guns go off and the bombs explode. Um, and, uh, and, and so I was there for maybe a couple of hours. And about that time, uh, the, the, the militia showed up. The people who captured me were all farmers. And uh, you know their weapons were axes and shovels and machetes and that kind of thing. That's, that's what they came after me with. Um, and, 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 and I had, I had a 38 revolver, you know, we carried a 38 revolver. Um, and I felt like that I probably could have, you know, done the John Wayne deal and, and, and shot six of them, but uh, there were a lot more than six. Yeah. And I was, and I was going to upset them pretty badly if I started shooting. So um, I, I put my hands up, gave myself uh, up. I, I surrendered. Uh, and, uh, and they stripped me of everything I had, uh, put me in the schoolhouse for a couple of hours. And then came the, the, the soldiers with a Jeep. And, uh, so they, they hoisted me up in this Jeep. I'm still hogtied. They tossed me in this Jeep. I'm still blindfolded, uh, and gagged. And it was a fairly short trip. It was probably 45 minutes or an hour for me to get to the formalized prison camp, uh, the Wallow prison camp, uh, which we, which we later named the Hanoi Hilton. It, it seems to me like that, those moments, you know, being tied to a desk, besides the lack of dignity, the waiting. And it's like that, that has got to be terrifying. Um, it, was long, it was a long, long time. Uh, I say two hours, it, it might've been an hour, but it seemed like it was maybe four hours just to wait. Because you know the bombs were exploding uh, in the neighborhood, uh, you know, other airplanes were being shot down in the neighborhood, and I didn't I didn't know from one instant to the next, you know, what, what my fate was going to be. So you you get to the the Hanoi Hilton, and you know, there's there's a place that they take you, and it, is there anything going on in your head? Like as you like you said, like with, you know, the childhood lessons you learned, your coaches taught you grit. You know, how exactly is that showing up, or does all of that go away in moments like that? Uh, you keep asking really good questions, and I, 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 I'm not sure I can answer that. I, I did really bad ones, so just hang well, on. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just re reacting. You know, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I don't have any great plans. I don't think back to uh, the principles that I was taught by coaches or, or, or teachers or mom and dad uh, or in the Boy Scouts or church or anything else. I'm doing some praying, you know, but, uh, but other than that, I'm just, I'm just reacting to what's going on within me. Now, uh, they, my co-pilot actually uh, came in a separate, um, uh, separate Jeep. Yeah, but we were all into the prison camp at the same time. And I had, I'm, I'm blindfolded, he's blindfolded. And I make this comment to him that he related to me several years after. He said, "You know, when you were in that, uh, when you were in that jeep and hollered at me, and I hollered back, and I said, "How are you, Gary?" And he said, "I'm doing okay." And you said, um, "These guys are a hundred percent. They're they're a hundred years behind in making their blindfolds." Now, why would I say a thing like that? See, that, that was one of the things that I said that just um, uh, made me think I must have been in shock. You know, I mean, why would you ever say something like that? I, I mean, understanding the severity of the situation, I just think that that is brilliant. And, and you know, when I'm asking you these questions, you know, I don't know myself. I mean, obviously, I've never been through the, the enormity of the situation that you've been through. But I, I remember what it's like to be, you know, completely asleep, woken up at two in the morning, punched repeatedly, have a pillow stuffed over your face and you can't breathe. You don't know why this is, I don't even know what's going on. So, so you know, I, I'm asking these questions, not, not just for the sake of a conversation, 
I really want to know because I don't even remember, you know, what goes through your head. And then you know, like using humor and, and levity and, and just, just connecting you in a terrifying situation, something that reminds you you're human, humanity there. Uh, levity was vital. Uh, I can remember times in that prison camp when my stomach would hurt. I was laughing so hard. And, you know, and you think, well, that can't be possible. <laughs> You're in there, so eight foot by eight foot prison cell. You know, you're crapping in a two gallon bucket that, but <laughs> that didn't have a lid on it. It was rusted out. You're eating two bowls of rice a day. You know, your best friends are rats and spiders and ants <laughs> and snakes. And you find some humor in this, uh, but uh, but it was amazing the 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 way that we connected with each other and the way we brought each other uh, some 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 levity in a, in a very challenging situation. You know, and you you hear so many philosophies about you know perseverance and you know what it takes to frame a situation in your mind and how you come out of it um, differently and in some ways better. And that's very easy to have that conversation without going through the actual experiences that produce those insights. And you hear stories about James Stockdale and about you know having this, this sense of, of unshakable belief, but at the same time, this awareness of the brutal facts of your current reality, what was, what was that psychological, emotional journey like for you for almost six years being a prisoner of war? Well, it, it, to begin with, I was very angry. I was just really, uh, and I was very embarrassed. You know, uh, embarrassed. I, and, oh, I, was, I was extremely embarrassed. Uh, and, and in fact, I didn't know it at the time, but I found out that every American pilot shot down went through this guilt uh, trip. Uh, we weren't we were not trained to surrender, you know, and and we were we we were not trained to to give up. And uh, in these series schools and in the military, they they teach you that if you're a prisoner of war, you're you're only obliged to give name, rank, serial number, date of birth. That's the code of conduct for a prisoner of war. And, and, and I flew the skies, and I think most of the guys flew the skies of Vietnam, thinking we were strong enough to stick with those four things, name, rank, show number, date of birth, and that's all. And, uh, you know, and they're going to feed you, and they're going to pay you. The Geneva Convention, which, which the Vietnamese had signed, uh, laid all this stuff out, you know, that they were supposed to pay us for work that we were doing and let us communicate with our families and, and give us, you know, books and reading material and all this stuff. And of course, they did none of that. In fact, it was just the opposite. But, but, uh, but the point is, uh, when you get, you know, when you get into that situation like that, again, you sort of, you, you sort of back up on the things you know in life. Well, I was really angry for three or four months. I mean, I was just ready to kill somebody because uh, I'd gotten myself into that situation, and I didn't want to talk to anybody because I, I knew that there were other fighter pilots in that prison camp. In fact, that's, that's primarily who were, was in the prison. It was an air war and fighter pilots were shot down and captured. So we had you know, hundreds of, of fighter pilots in this prison camp. And I thought to myself, I really don't want to communicate with any other fighter pilot because that guy is probably tougher than I am. He's probably better pilot. He's surely older because I was one of the youngest guys there. Uh, and, and the last thing I want to do is, you know, is admit to somebody else that I had failed in my mission so miserably. So after, after with all of this anger and all of this guilt built up, um, at probably a four month period, I thought back to something my mother had taught me. My mother was a, a wonderful woman of faith and she taught me about forgiveness. Well, of course, forgiveness is a principle of the Christian religion. I found it's also uh, an, an, an excellent, in fact, may, maybe one of the most um, essential uh, factors of survival. Because when I harbored all of this guilt and all of this 
hate, this vitriol within my body, I was killing myself. And I, I wasn't hurting the enemy at all. You know, I, I, I was still a military guy. I'm still a warrior. I'm supposed to hurt the enemy and I'm killing myself. And at that moment, I, I sort of pledged to myself, hey, I think I'm going to live through this. But if I, if I die, if they pull me out of here feet first, they got to they gotta work at it. I'm not going to do it myself. <laughs> I'm not going to give them, uh, you know, the, the, the pride of, of, of having this guy die on his own. And so from then on, I, I practiced forgiving the guards, the camp commander, uh, myself. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and I found that, that it was a forgiveness tends to be, um, it's a very freeing, uh, attitude. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, it, it and it worked it, it, and, it, and it continues to work in my life. I, I still continue to practice that. I think one of the things that people tend to misconstrue around forgiveness is that it's it's in some way excusing some behavior, and and, and it, it's in no way, shape, or form reconciling or or, or or accepting the behavior of somebody else. I, I when I was growing up, uh, my stepbrother did unspeakable things to me, things that I don't talk about, and not because not because I can't go there, because it, it's hard for people listening. So I, I don't speak about it, yet, you know, when he passed, I, I remember I, I had a sense of sadness for, for a lot of reasons, and there was, there was no love between me and him, but there was a sense of forgiveness, mm-hmm. and it was something I did for myself, like when you said free, and, and until, because, you know, I had a lot of guilt, that was, and, and, and my anger wasn't outwardly directed as much as it was inwardly directed about things that looking back as an adult and, and having the perspective of decades of time between the incident and where I am now, there's nothing a child could have done to prevent these things. That's not where your head is at close proximity to that situation. It takes time to get that level of retrospective insight and when you have that forgiveness, it, 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 it does free you. And out of that freeing comes resilience. And, you know, I define resilience not so much as mental toughness. Yes, it's that, but it's more. It's the ability, kind of like, like it, engineering, structural resilience, mm-hmm. to return back to a state of functionality. Not just about being mentally tough, it's returning back to how do I return back to being a functional human? Mm-hmm. Do I do I have your permission? Is it okay to talk about the things that like led up to when you said name, rank, serial number, and, and what led to those to those feelings of guilt? Is is that okay to go there? Sure, sure, sure. No, I'm I am very transparent. You know, ask me any question, just. Be, be ready for the answer. <laughs> um, the, the torture uh, was very painful, obviously. And it was uh, what we call the rope trick. Uh, they said our, our, our wrists were put into a sh- were, uh, were manacles. You know, they weren't loose handcuffs. They were actually manacles that uh, wrapped your wrists together, but that's behind your back. And then they pulled your elbows together. My, my elbows are actually pulling behind my back. Then he put uh, shackles between each ankle and ran a metal bar through the shackles. And then the rope trick was they tied a rope from the bar and the shackles up over my shoulder and down to my wrists. <clears throat> so what happens? Then they tight they they tighten up the rope, put put a big bamboo stick in there, and they start to wrap this thing up. And uh, and what happens is it pulls your it pulls your wrists up on your head. In fact, I remember one time looking up and seeing my wrists over my head backwards. Of course, by that time, your shoulders are out of joint. Uh, your feet are right up in your face. And then to add to that, they, uh, they take another rope or sometimes a chain and hoist you up to a hook in the ceiling of this torture room. And so 
and so as, as the pain increases, obviously, <clears throat> I found I found a little bit of a technique that I could could use uh, that I, that I later call a plateaus of pain. I would get to the point where I think, man, this really hurts. I, I, I you know, I, I'm alive, and if it doesn't get any worse than this, I think I'm going to live. And then they would tighten the rope, and it got worse. And then I would say, okay, it got worse, but oh by the way, I'm still breathing, I'm still thinking, I'm crying, and I'm bleeding, but I'm still alive. <laughs> and if it doesn't get any worse. I'm going to live through this. And then it got worse. And so these levels of uh, these plateaus of pain um, that I endured. And, um, you know, and obviously, eventually, I gave them more than name, rank, show number, date of birth. Uh, and, uh, and then they would ask me questions, and I would answer their questions, and they would, they would take me off of the hook in the ceiling and, and uh, loosen the ropes. And you know, the the reason why you know, I asked you that question, you know, there's 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 a couple of reasons why there's a couple of layers to that, but w one of those is because you go through that, and then you think, well, that that's an unimaginable experience to be in, and, and it is for most of us, thankfully. But then you go through in a lot of ways, what could be considered so much worse over the course of, of six years. And you, you come out of this and you've been in front of 5,000 audiences. I mean, you know, a, a, a lot of people are out there in the world and, and they would say, you know, I remember the day I, I heard Captain Charlie Plum speak and that made all the difference to me. So not only does that not break you, but you dedicate your life to elevating other people and, and anyone who walked out of that situation um, who would have any judgment about someone who completely broke, well, well, fuck them, first of all. Um, but not only did you not break, you became this. What, what contributes to that? Well, uh, first of all, uh... I get a lot of um, uh, satisfaction. Uh, I, I'm, I'm flattered. I'm honored when someone comes up to me, as, as you say, they do fairly frequently, and tell me that they heard me in, in their grade school 45 years ago, or they heard me at a graduation 40 years ago. And, and I couldn't tell you who spoke at my graduation the next day. Uh, and so I, I, am, I am flattered and honored that I can impact the hearts and minds of people uh, but, I, but, but that also, uh, I, I feel like gives me kind of a responsibility, uh, because if I can actually affect the hearts and minds of people, it better be in, in a positive way. But then the second thing that affects this is I, when I tell my story, I'm actually talking to myself. This is my therapy. Okay. This reminds me, you know, of what it takes to overcome the challenge in your life. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm continually, I'm continually working on applying the principles that I'm teaching. <laughs> and so, and so you know, it kind of keeps me honest uh, when I'm, when I'm speaking to, to groups and, and they respond in the way that they respond, then I got, you know, I say to myself, well, my holy smokes, you know, if, if you're going to tell them, you know, to, to get rid of this bitterness and anger in their life. If you're going to teach them how to, um, to make lemonade out of lemons, then pull up your big boy pants, Charlie, you know, don't, don't gripe about the traffic, you know, <laughs> don't, 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 uh, don't, don't gripe about the small things in life when what you're actually doing, you know, you're a hypocrite. If, if you're, blaming other people for your problems and feeling sorry for yourself because what you're teaching people is that you don't do that if you're you're going to be a you know if you're going to be a, a fully functional person there's, there's a couple of remarkable things I'm, I'm hearing you come out of a situation like that and you still have this sense going forward that even after all of that you're accountable for something the word you use is that you have a responsibility that even in the midst of those circumstances, life was asking something from you, a contribution. 
and you were making that contribution and in helping others and lifting other people up, that was part of your way out and, and coming back into society and evolving into the person that, that you've evolved into. And, and that's extraordinary. And, and there are also things that I've heard about. You had you were not really permitted to talk to anybody. There was no contact amongst prisoners. You figured it out. So what did you do to communicate? And, and what impact did that have? Why were those, as difficult as it was to communicate, why was that so critical? I don't think I'd be alive today if, if I didn't have a support group in that prison camp. Uh, the guys that I communicated with over there, going through the same thing that I was going through, uh, and similar backgrounds as me, uh, and felt as guilty as I did, and hated the enemy as much as I did, and, and had all the same vitriol within them that I did. Had I not been able to communicate with these guys, and we had we not had the leadership in that prison camp that we did, I, I just, I don't think I would have made it. So um, now we couldn't speak to anybody, but we did communicate a lot. Um, well, first of all, I was not in solitary confinement for very long. Some guys were in solitary for four and a half years. I was wow. only in solitary for a few months. Uh, I was a very junior guy. And so they put the senior guys in solitary because they were afraid that, you know, that they would organize and, and build a team. <clears throat> well, and so uh, a lot of the senior guys were in solitary, but we learned to communicate in a thousand different ways. We got really creative with our communication. Anytime you could hear, anyone, anywhere, we made a code out of the noises. For instance, uh, we, we first developed what we call the tap code. Okay, it's a five, if you can imagine a five by five box of the alphabet, five lines, five rows, A, B, C, D, E across the top, F, G, H, I, J. We left out K, substituted a C for K, but it was a five by five box. So any letter in that box could be represented by the number of the line, then the number of the row. A, first line, first, first row, one, one. Uh, and so if a guy, for instance, would get outside to chop wood for the fire, he could chop in this code. Chop, 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 chop. To me, that's genius. It is, yeah. But, 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 it, but here's the secret to genius, okay? When you have nothing to do, 24 sevens, no interruptions, okay? nothing you, you don't have books you don't have tv you don't have colors you don't have sounds you don't have you, you know the, the the biggest thing in your life might be you hear a bird tweeting outside you know um when you have nothing else to do you get really creative and so we could tap on walls with this code we could tug on wires if you could get a wire from one room to another as we, as we sometimes could uh, even uh even guttural noises uh, the the Vietnamese, most of them had tuberculosis and they assumed that we did too. And so you could cough and spit and make all these guttural noises. And when we found out that they paid no attention, we made a code out of the uh, out of these noises. Wow. So you'd wake up in the morning, hear the guys in a prison cell next door go, <laughs> that means good morning, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's there's just a couple of things um, I just want to pull out of this. And first of all, it's like we're we're surrounded right now with like weapons of mass distraction. And like I wonder, like wake up in the morning, the first thing you're on is your phone. You're tweeting, and it's like, and we're we're so obsessed with doing. I wonder what that does to our capacity to think and create. The second thing that I just want to pull out of that is you know, there's a book written by a guy named David Logan, and he talks about tribal leadership at different levels of tribes. And when you're out in the working world, in corporations, a lot of times you're encouraged to be this, this level three tribe. And a level three tribe is defined by I'm great. It's like, who is the superstar sales person? You know, who's who's the manager that that gets things done? And if you know, if you're a manager and you're taking any credit for getting anything done, you probably suck as a manager and you're not a leader. You know, it's your team there you're responsible for building. And what I pulled out of that is 
the word support. Like, like I would not be alive today if I did not have my support. And as much as we love to review, and that there is a lot to be said about personal responsibility and grit, but we love to identify heroism of a single individual. Yet, when the stakes are very high, it's your tribe, it's your, it is your team, it is your people that you need to lean on. I learned to communicate uh, in the prison camp by a guy who passed a wire across a storeroom and 14 feet later, he fished that wire into the hole in my cell wall. And he passed uh, a note written on a piece of toilet paper that had this five by five matrix of the alphabet that I've explained. And I started to communi communicate with this guy, Bob Shoemaker. And, and that's the first thing he, he told me because I'm, you know, I'm really depressed. Then he said, you will be happy to know that you've just joined the finest team you'll ever play on, bar none. He said, you will see in this prison camp the finest American leadership you will ever see, bar none. Uh, our, our leadership has turned this thing around. We are not on the defensive. We are on the offensive. We are warriors. We will pursue this war till our last dying breath. So pull up your big boy pants, Charlie. We got a war to fight. <laughs> that 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 coalesced, you know, the, 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 the troops, okay? And it, it, it refocused our mission, our raison d'etre. We suddenly had a purpose. And that purpose, you know, was, uh, was to return with honor. That was, our, that was our code, return with honor. And so when a guy would be put in the far corner of the prison camp and could not communicate or sometimes would not communicate. Sometimes guys felt so guilty that they didn't want to ever talk about how they had surrendered uh, and they would, they would not communicate with anybody. And I, and I almost did not, be, uh, but, um, but if a guy was put in the far corner of the prison camp and couldn't communicate with the rest of us, he probably wasn't going to make it. It was just that, it was just that serious. And to your point that, you know, we all need community, you know, we, we, we all need the support group. We all need somebody to, to validate our own sanity. So, and so the tugging on the wire or tapping on a wall or wheezing and sneezing uh, or chopping wood outside was more than just the words and the sentences, the meaning of the things we were passing on. It was a, it was a simple validation of another human being. That, that, that connection, you're identifying as one of the, the quintessential factors in, in people who made it out and people who didn't. Are there any other factors that you would say separated people who made it from people who didn't? Well, attitude obviously is a big thing. And I, I learned early on, and, and I try to use this today, is that um, a life without adversity uh, is a life without opportunity. And I believe mm -hmm. that every challenge in life, while we try to, to hide from adversity, you know, we do every, and, and we do this with our children, you know, we try our best to bring our children up without without any kind of challenge you know we don't keep score at this in the soccer games anymore everybody gets a trophy uh and big it, mistake yeah i think so and and without some kind of a challenge you you will never have an opportunity and 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 in 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 the prison camp i kind of figured out that it, that that when you're when you're met with a challenge okay you have a couple of choices uh you can cower away in the corner of your prison cell and cry and um, you know wish that it would all go away and blame everybody else your problem and feel sorry for yourself and you go into this pity party of life or you can stand up and approach the problem and figure out what it's going to take to, to, to solve the problem and so you waste adversity in life I believe by blaming other people or other things for the problem by feeling sorry for yourself and assuming that you have no input in the outcome. You know, I think most people who, and, and I fell into this and maybe you did too, you know, when you think you have no control of your destiny, 
when you are you're being put upon. Okay, you are a victim of circumstances beyond your control, and and that is a serious cancer. It just uh, it, it it kills an awful lot of people just to to hide in this cac this cocoon of of of, of bitterness and uh, and and frustration and guilt. Yeah, I, I think I found that. And I, I think what I'm hearing, because you know, um, some people might be listening to this going, yeah, but what about people who you know have been victims of such injustice and you've definitely suffered injustices? I'm not saying that you're not, you're not, you, your feelings aren't valid. They're not justified. What I'm hearing here is when you are rooted in blame and you're stuck there, have cut yourself off from any possibility of a solution and a way forward. You're done. You sealed your fate. You've lost the opportunity. Yep. Yep. T totally agree. And and it, I mean, it, <laughs> you and I can you you know you can I can pontificate about all this all night. But to try to convince someone who's going through a divorce or who's just been diagnosed with cancer, you know, or somebody who's just lost a child. Uh, and, and telling them, you know, buck up, buck up, dude, <laughs> and, and it, 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 it falls flat. Uh, and, and in fact, as I say, the first several months in that prison camp, there's no way you're going to explain to me there was any value in my, you know, in fact, I thought for a long time that the best this time in my life would ever be is a period of time I can forget. And, 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 and yet, uh, you know, forgetting it was was accepting uh, the fact that it had no value. Well, you, you know, this may come off a little bit judgmental. I think a lot of times the people who are screaming, I've got no excuses, get over it the loudest. Yeah. The people who, A, have not really faced challenges that have shaken their identity. Um, and sometimes those people terrified now, like you said when i'm talking to my audiences i'm talking to me when they're shouting condemning you really trying to boost themselves up because they're not sure that they would be able to endure not actually talking to you and, and what i i deeply appreciate about you in this conversation there's a lot of things i deeply appreciate about you the two things that come up most recently is your sense of humility empathy, perspective. I think that comes from, I mean, hopefully not going through the level of challenge you went through, but people who have gone through some serious stuff seem to present with that. So, so being a POW and saying, well, yeah, easy for me, somebody going through a divorce, that's still relative to them. That, that is a horrific situation. And to have that perspective, I mean, you know, I wonder, you've been in front of 5,000 plus audiences. Yeah, it, no, it is very true. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one with this story. You know, first of all, you look back through history and you find empathy, uh, you know, find perspective. You find people have, you know, look at Helen Keller, you know, look at uh, Martin Luther King, look at Jesus Christ. You know, uh, you don't have to go back for Abraham Lincoln. You know, a lot of, of, of well-known people went through some challenging, you know, really serious adversity in their life. You know, sometimes when people, after I, I speak and a, and a lady will come up to me and say, I could never have done what you have done. And I'll say, have you had children? And she'll say, well, you know, I've got three. I said, I've watched my wife go through childbirth. That's something I I, I, I Truly promise you, I could never do that. <laughs> and so it's all a matter of perspective. Uh, I, I, am, I am convinced that you can be in just as much of a prison uh, in your mind as I was over there in that eight foot box. Uh, it, it's all, you know, it's all, in your, all in your approach. And when you find yourself in that prison, what, whether, whether real or whether it's structural, situational, What would be a couple of things that you would tell someone in that situation? Well, first of all, I would tell them that um, this too shall pass. You know, uh, there, there, there is 
light at the end of the tunnel. It may be very dim. And then I will try to tell them, and you know, largely when I counsel people, I use my own example. And I, you know, I'll say, hey, I've, I've never faced what you're facing, but I've faced some of the similar kinds of things, you know, um, of depression and loneliness and guilt and, and frustration and, and self pity and blame and, and 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 that those are the things you're going through and let me tell you what happened to me i found that within the adversity that there is some kind of an opportunity that within every crisis in your life there will be some something that you can do to either grow or learn or be better or have more confidence in yourself and the key to life it's like a puzzle the key to life is figuring out what that, what that, uh, what that little nugget, okay, of uh, uh, of, of positive uh, thought comes from uh, the challenge itself, and so, and, and in fact, that's one of the things I, I I'm a man of faith, and uh, and and one of the scriptures that I that I called on a lot at prison camp was, um, all things work together uh, uh, for good. For those who love the Lord, and so if your you know, if your attitude is right, okay, then all things. And in fact, I thought about it at the time. I thought all things, even a prison camp, even something can work together for good, uh, in, in the pain that I'm feeling. And so, and and so I you know I set out to prove that to myself. Um, you you haven't talked about this, and I don't know if you want to to, to talk about this much, but. My wife, my high school sweetheart that I had married uh, the day after I graduated from the Naval Academy, uh, filed for divorce three months before I came home. Uh, and uh, and we met one time, and two weeks after I was released, we met and talked about the divorce and, you know, what happened to the dog and who gets a house and all this stuff. And I didn't see her for 42 years. 42 years later, I get a package in the mail, and it has a letter that my mother had written to my wife the day I was shot down. And of course I recognized my mom's handwriting. And, uh, and so, I, and it's a three page letter. And it said, and the package was from my ex-wife. Uh, and she had, she thought that I might like to see this letter, <laughs> which I did. But uh, in the first, on the first page of the letter, it said, it is so terrible, you know, that Charlie has been shot down and captured. And while we don't know at this point if he's even alive or dead, uh, and the terrible part is he had so much potential for affecting the lives of people. And then it says, but who knows what God has planned? This, this experience may, hit, may allow him to even be more effective at changing the hearts and lives of people. This is my mother, you know, okay, she's, she's writing this and is, you know, so prophetic uh, that she would write this that I was shot down to say, hey, you know, something good's going to come from this. Um, so, uh, and, and in that state that she was writing that, in, I mean, when you think about what you've gone through, but what your mother was going through, what your wife was I going truly, through. I truly believe that my mom and my wife had it tougher than I did. I knew I was alive. Every day I knew I was alive. I was confident that I was going to live through this and be better because of it. They didn't know from one day to another if I was alive or dead, if I'd ever come home, would I be a zombie? Would I be a burden to them the rest of their life? And, uh, and so it was, it was a serious thing for the families. Uh, and, and, and it's true with, with families of any military. You know, I mean, the guys and gals go off to war, but Oh, by the way, the folks back home uh, have their challenges as well. And in, in, we were talking about how important human connection is. And when when you were shot down, you know, your, your wife and her support group, that response was rather isolating for her. It was, and it was terrible. Uh, you know, of course, it wasn't. It wasn't designed that way. It wasn't the military deal. It was just uh, human nature. Is that we had a very strong wives' club. Of course, we were all men at that time, and uh, and our wives were back home, and they would bake cookies and send us, uh, you know, tapes and letters and that kind of thing. And they would meet once a week. 
But when one of the pilots was killed or captured and happened to about a fourth of our squadron, uh, the other, the wives would not know what to say to these poor ladies. Yeah. And so they were kind of summarily uh, ousted from the group and they lost that support, um, it, which, you know, which was another advantage I had over my first wife is that I, I had guys there who go through the same thing I did. And, you know, we could laugh and scratch and, and joke about it and, and uh, you know, have birthday parties for each other just by tapping on the walls and talking about presents and stuff. And, and, uh, and they did not. And so, uh, of course, my wife was living in San Diego at the time as I was flying out of uh, Miramar. And, um, and so she had to move back to Kansas with her parents and my parents back there because it was the only support group she had. Now, the, the government and the military also told all of our wives, zip lip, don't talk about your husbands, because if you talk about your husband and it gets back to the enemy, they'll torture those guys, you know, so don't speak to the media, don't speak to your neighbors, don't tell anybody that you're, you've got a prisoner of war over there. Uh, and, and, and again, that was tough on the wives. Extremely. Um... Now, some of the wives rebelled, and this is a story that I hope is told one of these days because they were really the heroines of, of, of this war. Uh, about, I guess, three or four years uh, in, while I was in a prison camp, the wives decided, this is BS, you know, uh, and they started a, a club. It was called uh, uh, Viva, Voices in Vital America. And the wives got together and started to make trips to foreign countries and, and our own government petitioning our government and embassies and consulates around the world to put pressure on the North Vietnamese, stop torturing my husband. And it worked. Um, they, they had Kissinger in his memoirs, as a matter of fact, at one point says, these ladies were a thorn in my side because uh, they were trying to, to make international policy and I was in charge. So um, the military and the government didn't like what they were doing, but the Vietnamese recognized how, uh, by pressure from everybody else, uh, that they were supposed to, to follow the Geneva Convention with the head signed and not torture the prisoners, the husbands of the wives who were doing this. And so um, the gals really were responsible for our improved treatment um, years before we came home. That, that is a story that absolutely needs to be told. One more thing that I'd like to explore with you, um, and this goes back to a conversation I had on the show with a mutual friend of ours, another extraordinary individual, Susan Sly. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about, a, she had these incredible series of, of adversity, horrible situations. Any one of them would be horrific. And she had them like one on top of the next all at the same time, but it wasn't that. That wasn't the most painful thing. The most painful thing was losing her identity that I used to be this person and I can never be this person. And who am I? And I've got to go out now and reinvent myself. So you know, we think about how horrible it must have been to be a POW. What about coming home? Like, how do you, because you talked about your wife filed for divorce. Now you're home. You have to, you can never go back in many ways to being the Charlie Plum you used to be. There's a new person that needs to emerge. How do you, how do you deal with that? And how, what does that reinvention process look like? It was uh, one of the most um, delightful, joyful periods of my life. Um, I, I came home, we flew out of, uh, of Vietnam into Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. The first guy I talked to was a psychiatrist. And um, he, he said, from what you've been through and now your wife has have divorced you, you need to get angry. You can go back to your hospital room and, and punch in the walls, kick the door down if you want to, because you needs to show some anger. You deserve to be bitter. And I told him, you know what? I deserve to have diarrhea, but I don't deserve to be bitter. <laughs> and, uh, 
And, and, and he said, oh, and here, here's what he said. he said to me. He said, you know, if you delay this, the longer you delay letting this out and, and showing your physical uh, pain, uh, your, your mental pain physically, um, then the harder the breakdown is going to be. Well, that was 47 years later. I'm still waiting for the breakdown. <laughs> so, uh, so coming home, first of all, was the light. Having a door a knob on the inside of my door, you know, just the freedom to walk through a door, you know, and, and all the wonderful things. Uh, it was even, even with the tragedy of my broken marriage uh, and even with the tragedy of the six years that I had lost, man, I was, I was just so happy, exuberant, you know, to, to try to get back on with my life and, um, and do all the things that I had dreamed about doing in the prison camp. I went back to flying, uh, you know, and, and I, I flew in the Navy, you know, for another six or eight years. Uh, I, I, in fact, I still fly today. I have two little airplanes of my own um, that I fly. And, uh, and so the what's, your, what's your favorite? My favorite airplane? Mm -hmm. Whichever one I'm flying. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the Phantom was hard to beat. I later, uh, the last airplane I flew in the Navy was the F-18 uh, Hornet, which is uh, a really a delightful airplane. Um, and so I, I, I've, I, I guess it kind of depends on where I am and who I'm with and what the weather is with my favorite airplane. But I, today I have an antique airplane from World War II, which I love. Uh, and I also have an experimental airplane, which is uh, fully aerobatic, bubble canopy, stick and throttle. Um, and uh, it's a, it, it scoots along at about 200 miles an hour. And uh, it, it's a thrill too. So it gets in your blood. Yeah, I can't think of anything more rewarding than to one, know in no uncertain terms exactly what it is that you love, and two, to immerse yourself in that. I think it was Baudelaire that said uh, back in the 19th century, you know, get drunk. And when, you know, when I first read this quote, I took it literally. I don't remember what happened much that year, but, you know, rereading it sober, he wasn't talking about Alcohol. He said, you know, this is the great imperative. If you do not want to feel time's hard fall bruise upon your shoulders, grinding you into the earth, get drunk and stay that way. It's like, on what you ask? Wine, poetry, virtue, um, yeah. airplanes, you know, yeah. just yeah. get drunk. And I think that is, that is the key to feeling alive whilst you're living. I love it. Yeah, great philosophy. Get drunk. I'll try to do that tonight. See, I'm already getting after it. A man of action. <laughs> Captain Charlie Plum, I could literally talk to you for hours on end. Um, I just want to say, um, if I can encapsulate it with the words, thank you. I just want to say thank you for this. Thanks for that. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of your conversation. You were, I've been interviewed by some very major, well-known national people. And uh, I can't remember one that's better, that, that has really gotten into more deep thought uh, and that's, that's asked me questions which were really, really valuable. So thanks for that. Honored. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.